does the time it takes for a drug to be cleared from the body define the duration of its side effects? The short answer is no, and I'll explain why using real-world examples including a dog who suffered neurological side effects after receiving Librella. Burn injuries make a useful analogy for adverse drug reactions. Allergic drug reactions are like hot stove burns. They occur almost instantly, so the link between the drug, in this analogy the hot stove, and the side effect, in this case the burn, is clear. We know how to manage hot stove burns, remove our hand from the source of heat, learn our lesson, i.e. don't touch the hot stove again, and seek first aid for our injury. Allergic drug reactions require straightforward decision making, but they're rare. Non-allergic drug reactions are far more common. They're like radiation burns. They do not occur instantly, which makes it much harder to implicate the source of radiation as the cause of the burn. In other words, I'm suffering, but I'm not sure why. Aspirin makes a good example of drug allergy versus intolerance. The first time someone with an aspirin allergy takes it, they'll quickly learn to never take it again. I take aspirin, I develop obvious symptoms like hives or breathing difficulties, I seek appropriate treatment, and I never take aspirin again. Aspirin allergy affects less than 1% of people, which makes non-allergic reactions at least 20 times more common. The classic non-allergic reaction to aspirin is a peptic ulcer. But linking a peptic ulcer to aspirin isn't easy. Peptic ulcers are notoriously difficult to diagnose, and there are many potential causes including stress, a poor quality diet, alcohol consumption, and pathogenic gut bacteria. Let's say that I've been suffering chronic indigestion and heartburn, and then I start vomiting blood. My doctor suspects a peptic ulcer. They make an urgent referral to a gastroenterologist who instructs me to immediately stop taking aspirin. Now, when I follow their instructions, my body clears aspirin's active metabolites salicylate within hours. And any drug residues bound to my platelets disappear within days. That's it for aspirin. It is now out of the picture. But my gastroenterologist is just getting started. They'll review my other important risk factors. Do I smoke? Am I under a lot of stress? How's my diet? And do I drink too much alcohol or caffeine? They'll probably order GI endoscopy and a helicobacter pylori test. And my treatment will not last for the handful of days it takes my body to clear itself of aspirin. It'll last for the months or years it takes for my peptic ulcer to heal. And if it does heal, I won't consider myself cured. I'll be managing that problem for the rest of my life. Now, if we translate this scenario to a neurological side effect in a dog taking Librella, we have the same principle but a different specialist. A veterinary neurologist takes Librella out of the picture simply by discontinuing the drug. Once they've done that, they'll recommend a treatment program which depends entirely on the problem they're treating. Is it canine cognitive dysfunction, wobbler syndrome, a type 1 thoracolumbar disc extrusion? type 2 lumbar disc protrusions, lumbar sacral disease, degenerative myelopathy, the list goes on, which is why a specialist neurologist's input is so important. Now I'll answer two questions with the help of two dogs taking Librella. Some of you already know Guido. He'll help me answer question one, how do we identify a low-risk patient? Well, before starting treatment, Guido had a series of diagnostic tests, including advanced imaging of his spine and multiple joints, and all of those tests came back normal. His only detectable problem was elbow osteoarthritis. Why is this important? Well, I'll use another analogy to explain. If someone asked me if walking is safe, I'd say, yes, of course. But walking stops being safe if you're in a dangerous situation. Like, for example, walking along the edge of a cliff. If we're walking somewhere safe and we fall, we can dust ourselves down and get up. Physiological terms, our ability to dust off and get up is called our reserve capacity. But many dogs, especially older dogs, aren't like Guido. 
Concurrent conditions means they have a limited reserve capacity. They could be walking along a metaphorical cliff, but if their owner can't see it, they're taking a much bigger risk than they realize. Safe use of any medication means doing everything in our power to know where we are relative to that cliff. Dogs like humans have an impressive reserve capacity, but only up to a point. They could, for example, lose a kidney and still seem normal. But if we knew they only had one kidney, we'd take special precautions. We might, for example, change their diet and avoid certain medications. Librella suppresses nerve growth factor. Nerve growth factor's job description, as the name implies, includes regulation of nerve cell growth, survival, and plasticity. In other words, a nerve's ability to dust itself down and get up again. The nervous system, like the kidneys, has an impressive but finite reserve capacity. And many dogs who seem normal actually have the nervous system's equivalent of a single kidney. Now, we need to look out for these dogs and take special precautions to protect their reserves. Which brings us to my second case example. This is one of my patients who I'll call Sam. He's going to answer the second question, do some dogs have a higher than average risk of Librella intolerance? At age nine, Sam was diagnosed with arthritis of both front feet. Foot arthritis in dogs like hand arthritis in people is common. In many dogs, it's present without causing clinical signs. That's because joints like kidneys and the nervous system have a significant reserve capacity. In Sam's case, his foot arthritis caused intermittent flares of pain and reduced exercise tolerance, which is typical. Sam responded quite well to anti-inflammatory painkillers, but his improvement on Librella, which he started aged 10 and a half, was profound. Around the same time he started Librella, Sam had mild hind limb problems. He was losing muscle and he seemed weaker, changes which might have been related to growing old but he also tended towards a slightly wobbly gait and he sometimes scuffed his paws. Sam continued to do very well on Librella, but after his sixth dose, his paw scuffing progressed to intermittent knuckling. Then aged 11 years, three months, Sam's condition suddenly worsened. Overnight, his hind limbs became too weak to take his weight and Sam couldn't get up. He had painful swelling called cellulitis affecting one of his hind limbs, and he was urinary incontinent. In effect, over the course of 10 months, Sam was a much happier dog thanks to Librella, but he was gradually inching closer and closer to his metaphorical cliff until one day he fell. Sam decompensated, which is always a very frightening situation for everyone involved. And when we're frightened, we dread two things in particular, uncertainty and lack of control. We want an accurate forecast about when the side effects will subside, and we want a simple solution to the problem. When we're desperate for clear and simple solutions, but there aren't any clear and simple solutions, we're vulnerable to myths and misinformation. And unfortunately, even though it's a new drug, Librella has attracted more than its fair share of both. The first pervasive myth is the fallacy that the duration of a side effect is directly related to Librella's elimination half-life. This is not true. Recovery after decompensation depends on the patient, not the drug. Just as falling off a cliff depends on the injury sustained in the fall, not the gust of wind that caused it. Just as recovery from a peptic ulcer doesn't take two to four hours because aspirin's half-life is two to four hours, we shouldn't expect Librella side effects to subside after a month just because that's its elimination half-life. The second pervasive myth is the popular notion that the solution to one drug side effects is to add another drug. This is like focusing on the cause of the fall when we should be busting our guts trying to haul our patient to safety. Now, I'm aware of the misinformation being circulated about, about a potential reversal agent. 
I assure you that the source of this information is not a veterinary specialist, and I intend to address the question of reversal agents in another guide. Here's the truth. Hauling a non-ambulatory patient to safety requires enormous emotional time and financial commitments. On top of that, anyone making these commitments must do it knowing success is not guaranteed. This is a very harsh reality. So if someone who believes they know what they're talking about, but in reality doesn't know what they're talking about, offers a more appealing reality, for instance, that dealing with labrella side effects means simply sitting tight for the one to two months it takes to clear the drug, or we can give another drug to reverse labrella side effects, it's human nature to embrace this more appealing reality, even if it's false, which it is. Although I could talk about this subject for hours, I have to finish somewhere, which means I must leave many unanswered questions. But in truth, this will happen every time I publish a new guide, and for this I offer my apologies. Researching Librella's effects and side effects while fielding dozens of requests to start new discussions day after day is stressful and labour-intensive. I'm already giving everything I can afford to give, so for anyone who feels I'm being evasive or elusive, I'm sorry, but this choice is born of necessity. I do it purely to make this resource sustainable. Thank you for visiting. Thank you for wanting the best for your dogs. And thank you for understanding.